Bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Max Welcome. Colton. My name is Max Colton. I'm coordinator of cultural program in the Goethe Institute, Mexico. We are really happy and proud to present this edition today from Mexico City in our series of, of digital debates, radical diversity. We will be joined by our poet and publicist Max Scholek as moderator. He's joining us from Berlin. Now I give him the floor and I wish all of you a very interesting conversation. Hello everyone. Um, Einen schönen guten Abend aus Berlin, a very good night from Berlin. Uh, it's already dark and late here, as you, you can see that, but I can tell you the, the light has already passed. Um, happy to have all of you in the channel, very happy and excited about the panel today. This is, as Max said, part of, the, of a series we do. Uh, we had two series now in the US, now it's going to be the first one and last one for that one in Mexico. I'm really happy we're doing this and really excited about what's going to happen today. Before we start, and before I give the floor to, to our wonderful panelists, let me just give you a short idea of who's going um, who's gonna to talk now. Uh, I'm going to start with Violeta Orcasitas. Um, Violeta is an independent curator of contemporary art. Uh, from 2007 to 2012, she was part of the Jumex Collective in the research and curatorial programs area and has curated herself in different museums and countries. I'm not repeating them because it's really a lot of things. Check it out online if you're interested. And for sure, Violette is going to talk about that too as well, about her own work. Furthermore, she teaches and writes incessantly about art topics in several different medias. Also there, just do some research. If we have a lot of, like a large Spanish-speaking crowd tonight, you're going to be able to understand more than I do. Um, and Violetta runs the radio program Cocktail Art Parties and Disasters, which is an amazing title by itself. In 2015, she founded Satellite, as I understand the thing she's going to talk about today most, a curatorial initiative that reflects on the institutions of the museum as an exhibition space. The project opens up new possibilities in the curatorial field by presenting it in like un unusual ways, artworks and institutional spaces. Satellite is a disruptive and do-it-yourself project um, that could be summarized as thinking outside the box and inside the white cube. Now today we don't really have a white cube here, but we do have a kind of cube, at least my laptop looks like that. So Violetta, happy to have you here on the, on the team. And now Clara and Ali, I'm going to start with Clara and then go on with Ali. Um, you understand in just a second why I say both names together. Clara was born in 1986 in Mexico City, is a researcher and curator of modern and contemporary art from a historiographic approach and cultural medi mediation. Um, and uh, she accompanies critical and friendly conversations about art from the self-managed spaces Tertulia Klatskala 3. Tres. You're gonna, the translation is going to be much better than what I do, but um, we're going to hear about that space a lot because Ali and Clara are working there together and their presentation is going to be on their work with, with the space. Um, Clara has worked as a researcher at museums such as the Museo Nacional de Arte um, and the Museo Universitario Arte Contemporaneo, which is um, MUAC, as I understand you call it in Mexico. Um, furthermore, there's a running cooperation on indigenous art in Latin America between MUAC and Tate. And this is just taking place now. I checked it out. It's going to be open until end of October. So go check it out if you can. And Ali, um, the last one on the panel, is a cultural manager, researcher, and holds a degree in communication studies, um, which he apparently needs because he's working as an art coordinator and communicator um, in the private and public sector, for example, for culture festivals, the Museo Nacional del Virenato, <laughs> and the Museo Jumex Artes Contemporaneo. And also since 2018, he has been co-programming the Tlaxia Cala Tres. So we're going to hear about that second. Uh, no, we're going to hear about that first. So now Ali and uh, Clara are going to do the first presentation. 
then Violetta is going to be the next one, and then we're going to start talking. And one last thing for the audience. Um, if you got any questions, feel free to type them into the chat window, and they're going to reach us through unknown paths, and they're going to reach me, and then we're going to try to kind of pick them up as we move along. So please feel motivated to ask questions if you can. So Clara, Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Hola a todos. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure for Tlaxcala 3, Clara and me. This morning, Mexico City, the big Tenochtitlan, as was known 500 years ago. And Clara, she's from Tepoztlan, Mexico. So we are joining you guys to share with you and Violeta with the Good Institute people and everyone present in this conversation space that is so important to talk about contexts that may not have to do with cultural institutions, but self-sufficient spaces. Thank you, Clara. My name is Ali Cotero. Thank you, Max, for this presentation from the cold Berlin. Here we have a sunny and, and hot day. So, you know, it's a quite lovely morning to share with you guys for all of us who are in Mexico City. And I want to thank all people present. I, I, I love seeing names of friends and family about this project, Tlaxcala Tres, founded by Clara Bolivar and myself in 2018. So we are an artistic joint venture office, and I'll give you some context about us. So we are sustained from a discipline that is called cultural management, or at least is it is known like that in this part of the country. So cultural management has led us to work with this project like that, that you know like i was saying is an artistic joint office and it's a space where people from different disciplines gather and different communities they gather after clara and i worked as max said in artistic cultural institutions and with community focus in some cases we understood that you know we wanted to have non-hierarchical conversations, not from an institution standpoint. Well, you know, when an organization person, a curator would establish conversation, but rather everyone together would be able to de-hierarchize, to mediate conversations. So we're in a space that we propose dialogues from contemporary art as I was saying, with different communities, artists, curators, philosophers, uh, researchers, any discipline actually that can be inserted in, into the conversation. That is, we are not looking for experts, but we are looking for people to come closer for these reflections in, in the Tlaxcala 3 Artistic Joint Office. And now, Addressing the current concerns and the aesthetic concerns, we do this from a perspective of trust, of care, and especially, you know, to have a loving conversation space. You know, I know it sounds hippie, but it's really important to think that love is important to share our knowledge. And I say it like this, but, you know, I know it sounds kind of hippie, this love thing, but you know, now it's a resistance way. It's a radical way to establish a conversation. I'm sorry, it's a bad joke for me, but it's actually this. I mean, we also started by using a non-binary language. I mean, we don't use gender in the noun, so we can establish this trust link with any diversity of, of people. Remember, in Spanish, nouns have gender, so we are trying to neutralize that. We want to take down this binary idea and some scripts from the patriarchy with this communication that is happening in a hierarchic way. This is how it comes from heteronormated way of communicating. We want to step outside this. In Tlaxcala 3, to tell you about the physical space, because there is an actual physical space, in the uh, neighborhood Roma Sur in Mexico City. So we have a, you know, a house space. This is a garage. You can see it here. 
is my family's house of the of the Cotero family. We thank them to to redistribute the privilege of being a, a really you know privileged geographic zone. It's easy to access there, so they remodeled. It was my grandparents' house. He was a, a painter himself. And you know, this is a Cotero family house. And then the, the garage, as you can see, is a space we opened to have conversations in 2018 with the idea of you just get together, talk, come uh, have conversations about current topics. So, you know, Clara and myself, we came up with a confidence environment in a physical way for 2019 we started making the study circle objects before and after the wall this was in 2019 with some support of the humex arte contemporary new foundation and also with the institute of endotic research based in berlin germany So we could establish a long-term and long-distance conversation as a strategy that we also use as a base of the male art, which, as you know, is a Latin American artistic manifest manifestation that, you know, you have access to the mail. You can send any information to anywhere in, in the world. So it's a long-distance conversation. Here, as you can see, got a put a visual poem that is talking about the domestic wall. What we do here in Tlaxcala 3 is we circle around conversations, ideas, thoughts, theories, strategies. So, you know, this poem we're seeing here, it's a conceptual idea of this domestic wall, which is Tlaxcala 3, or these walls that hold this conversation. So we resignify this wall, so they would become domestic and yield the friendship wall. You know, this contention wall where we circle political stories of objects under curate, curatory perspectives, you know, like body, cracks, earthquakes, materiality, archives, open source writings. Moving back again to 2018, we organized the first international object meeting with no people made in Bikini Wax EPS, Contemporary Art Space. And then we applied for the grant, for the Humex grant, for the curatory and theoric uh, research. And then all of us, we did with the Institute for Endotic Research and Tlaxcala 3, where this conversation were happening in Berlin, in an apartment in Berlin, in a kitchen. And here we had the conversations in a garage. And so, you know, we started this research in which, uh, you know, we organized so we could self-manage our space, you know, with the support of Humix and, you know, a small fee uh, for conversation so we could uh, maintain ourselves. And then we started growing. You have a space where we could have water, tea, where we could talk for some hours and, you know, contain ourselves through conversation, to contain our words, to listen to each other, to understand our current feeling, our sensibilities before this uh, capitalist system we're living in. Also, in this collective research, this, this is the Circulo de Studios, objects before and after the wall, we also started thinking how walls have, you know, toughened you know, the territorial walls, like the, the U.S.-Mexico wall, you know, this stolen land that, you know, with this wall that is growing every day, you know, we started thinking from that point. And also the, the when Berlin's wall fell down in 89, after this wall, we, you know, looking through the rubbish of the, of the Berlin's wall, we addressed racism walls, economic walls, and this, so tough walls that are held by the capitalist system. And today with the pandemic and the health crisis and COVID-19, you know, we see that these tough walls have cracks. And, you know, these cracks 
in this neoliberal world are also cracking ourselves and make us feel out of place, confused, uh, because, you know, the system, as we know it, is fracturing. By 2020, this year, we went from physical reality to virtual reality. Clara and I decided, well, okay, we will not fracture how we work. We will strengthen it. We made our domestic world even stronger through a people's constellation, a friend's constellation, researchers, tutors, people who have made this circle of the studios from 2020, where we are researching the matter. These are long-term conversation, long process uh, works. We really enjoy processes. So Clara will be telling us about these processes we established, as I was mentioning, in the long-term and long-distance conversations. So this study circle we came up with in 2020 is made with the GITAS, the Global Center for Advanced Stories, And this is based in the south of Latin America. We are a Latin American collective. Clara and myself, we belong to the CICAS. So we came up with the 2020 studies here, objects and matters, you know, around the effects of the wall and materialities around the wall. And of course, this is also thought around art. We, all, we move from art mostly. Another study is, you know, male art. Male art, again, uh, I'm repeating myself, you know, this long distance, long term conversation. Imagine the post before. This is how we work. So we invited people to participate in the second encounter of objects before and after the world that comes from this research in 2019. And so we made an open invitation based on the male art strategies. So we could see around 40 uh, collaborations from different latitudes. A lot of Latin America, you know, a lot of denouncement topics, you know, male art being a communication way that is non-hierarchical because you know there are there is no mediation between the sender and the receiver. It's only the male that that's mediating in that sense. This is why we thought an as an open uh, conversation so we could participate from art centers. And I say this center an idea to, to, to dismantle it from the center. Because, you know, Mexico City and Berlin are artistic centers. And, you know, male art allowed us to dismantle this centered oriented ideas and, and gave us a chance to connect with different people from different parts of the world and receive collaborations for this gathering that happened on November the 9th and, and 2019. 30 years after Berlin walls fell down. So we started thinking about these collaborations. And this is what we have been making from then. We have several uh, phases, uh, different uh, consequences. One of them is a public that we will be letting you know. For anyone who's interested, you can track our steps through Instagram in Tlaxcala 3. And then you can find out different phases of these collective investigations. And so far is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Ali. Can you all listen to me? Hi. Hi, Ali. Hi, Violeta. Hi, Max. Thank you, Good Institute, for the invitation to present this project. As Ali was saying, uh, we made an open invitation. We didn't want to do like a, curio you know, a curatory invitation from a center. No, we wanted to invite anyone to reflect on contemporary reflection on the walls. And the invitation we 
published in the Center of Studies of Nice and Useless Things in Santiago de Chile had a great response. As Ali said, we received uh, over 40 proposals, Colombia, the US, Mexico, Ecuador, the Netherlands, Germany. So it was important for us to, you know, November the 9th, you know, when we had the 30 years of the wall falling down, simultaneously we presented this project. So this map wall you can see here, we can see all the locations. You, we had Ciudad Juarez, Guadalajara, Mexico City, Bogota, Quito, Santiago de Chile, Berlin, and Miami. So it was a simultaneous event with the possibilities of participation from, uh, you know, critical text, audiovisual material, drawings, concrete or visual poets, instructions to take down walls or put up walls. So from art, we made this invitation and as Ali was saying, these uh, pieces were exhibited on November the 9th and we are working on a publication that we will let you know of now for the second encounter of the tier in berlin we made a uh, they made a publishing uh, and you know that day on november the 9th we made there in the, in the institute for endotic research in berlin we made a free workshop run by medina, uh, daniela medina poch it was called Global Warming, Reggaeton, and Emotional Mi Micropolitics. And you can see a bit of the of the dynamic. We really like to circle uh, around, to have a lot of straws, so anyone can express freely about what is being talked there. So we gave the participants sheets, and they were asked how everyday objects can make and can channel your hopes and your anger to the world. And from this, with several everyday objects, we made up uh, reggaeton lyrics. So it had to do with, you know, how Latin American community is living in Berlin. And, you know, the political situation that was being lived back then, you know, the social outbreak was happening in Chile, in Colombia, in other countries in Latin America. So this is what we did on November the 9th. And, you know, in Berlin, we had events that were reflecting about the wall as a thing of the past. We were insisting that the wall is a present thing and it's hardening further and its effects are even ever stronger. And the last phase of this uh, research is in uh, editorial process. Now it's a book publishing by Festina uh, Publishing, uh, an independent a publishing house in Tijuana and Mexico City. And in this one, we will compile most, we will make a selection of the collaborations. And we will show, you know, the diversity uh, of the proposals of the artists, researchers, man, uh, cultural managers. So we are seeing the love letter to the wall. This is a concrete poetry that Marisol Garcia Waltz gave up. So you can see that you have some, you have poetry. There's a huge variety in these forms, you know. Uh, objects, showcase, audiovisual material, they will all be together in this uh, book. And to wrap it up and, and, and move along to the conversation, I wanted to tell you that while we were editing the, the book, pandemic hit. And so what we did is that a lot of people that had already uh, worked or participated in this first selection for the book, we invited them to reflect on the pandemic walls. So in this sense, the public will have an appendage where we talk about the walls of the pandemic. And we want to show you these two proposals. One of this is Daniela Medina Ponch. She lives there in Berlin. And she reflects a lot about how migratory policies will change or are changing in European countries after the COVID crisis. You can read the full article in Asian Art Magazine. And what we were interested in is 
to show how the art space, according to this diagram from Daniela and Juan Pablo Garcia Sosa, she says that art space is a space where we can also observe these new temporalities, these new rhythms, new changes that, you know, we can see nowadays, and especially to think if there is a very uh, controversial here after Corona time, you know, AC, as if we would be able to set a new timeline, you know, if, you know, this pandemic and this crisis will be a breaking point or uh, a new important point on how we see art. And the last collaboration we want to show here is Maria, Maria Sus is called a 500 year old virus. And we were thinking, how can we think that all of these walls are very old walls as if the virus was a, just a new face as all of these walls we live every day so this collaboration as i was saying was born a bit about the the possibility of of being included in the book but it has already been uh, intervened by other latin creators they are a collective that they also want to de-hierarchize the art and what they did is that this participation in the book was printed as a poster and is spread all around in the mexico city so you may see it uh, in uh, any corner and this book closes in how we think now you know the notion of a wall after this crisis. For us, you know, coloniality itself is a wall, race is a wall, gender is a wall, class is a wall, anthropocentrism is a wall. And, you know, from art, we can think, how can we exit, at least in our imagination, this wall, you know, the power of imagination, what can we think? We can remove a wall between human communities and non-human communities. Yeah, you know, these power structures that are still current and they perpetuate the virus that happened in this continent for at least 500 years. So this idea of, of the virus of the world as a blinding thing that won't let you see through. So from the space of arts, we invite you to see on the other side of the wall and think how we can imagine a future with no wall. So thanks again. And we can, let, let's move on. Uh, Ali and Clara, thank you so much for the, for the insight in your work and the presentation. Let me ask one question before we move on to Violetta. Um, and that is because the discussion series on radical diversity is being set up as a means to communicate between a German and a, let's say, North American, Central American space. Um, and I got to correct myself, it hasn't been two, but three shows we've done in, in the States so far. So um, I'd, be, I'd be just interested if you could elaborate a bit on, on um, the, con like the difference and connection of Germany and Mexico, as understood the Institute for Endotic Research is based in Berlin. And Clara, at least I know you have spent some time there. So would you just elaborate a bit on the similarities and differences of the German and Mexican situation? Thank you, Max. Well, Lorena Tavares and I, in, in the team of Tlaxcala 3, we were in Berlin to coordinate the second uh, object and walls, uh, second international gathering. And, you know, in the end, we kind of understood that, you know, Mexico and Germany have these things in common, you know, a wall that crosses them, different stories, different geographies. But in the end, you know, in, in a structural way, this is uh, the wall is a physical expression of the walls that divide society and they have to do with, with what we said before with the work of maria so for us 
it was important to to make visible these walls that are still being built here in Mexico in Latin America. You know, we as uh, border neighbors of the U.S. It's a really interesting situation from the rest of the Latin American countries because this kind of makes us geographically part of North America, but we share history and problems with the rest of Latin America, you know, you know of peoples who have moved from their lands. So we, we also see that the difference it may lie there. These were stolen lands 500 years ago. These were violently took, uh, I'm sorry, violently taken lands for from peoples who are still living in this land. And, you know, this coloniality implies power structures that are very old, that have repeated themselves, that have transformed, and, you know, from the art space, we see a possibility to trace them. And we also see that you know, Berlin has to do with a migration sign. But here, you know, in Mexico, we have like both. We have communities with, who have been here for a lot of time in, in really uh, poor situation and also migrant communities that have to go through Mexico in their journey to the US. And, you know, land and Mexico in the end makes them really uh, hard in life. So we want to make this visible. People now are being in detention camps in the border. People are dying. Children taken away from their families. You know, every time we talk about Mexico, we talk about violence, obviously, you know, like in there, what else can we talk about? The violence in this country, but, you know, we also think we need to make this even more complex, you know, this violence. We can also show that there are several layers that we need to, delve into you know so what's interesting is is the very notion of radical diversity sometimes we are all privileged but at the same time we are all uh you know uh, beaten down by the system so art allows us to be aware of this uh this place we had no as uh, as we had a, a mexican and a colombian in, in in berlin sometimes we had but we you know we are fair skinned so sometimes we were discriminated because we were Latin women, but sometimes we also have the sort of quote unquote privilege of being white. So that, that, that I would like to say, yes. And on the other side, what Clara says about coloniality and different uh, likenesses that may have between lands, let's not talk about cities taken lands. In this coloniality that we understood from the world, while Clara and Lorena were in Berlin, here in Mexico, we had the, the, the gathering at the same time with Tlaxcala. So what we were thinking is that power hierarchy, you know, this empowering thing is what causes a constant hierarchy. And, you know, puts ever, ever taller walls, hard to go through because of hierarchies. So now let's go about disempowerment. Let's remove ourselves from empowerment. And now let's go towards the non-human. Like also let's understand, you know, the environment. Okay, you are in a taken land, so you put up walls and now we cannot know what's on the other side of the wall. However, when you look at the non-human, you also look at this possibility of allow ourselves to feel, to be vulnerable. I think an affinity between the walls of Merlin and Mexico is how vulnerable we feel when we face a concrete structure. And maybe also that human is another big move because they don't let us see what's behind because we don't want to show ourselves as vulnerable because capitalist system has shown us not to be vulnerable, let's just execute, let's work, let's be economic so we can up and sustain other walls. Another invitation to this is let's crack these walls. Let's show ourselves vulnerable as human beings. That, that would be my, my remark. Thank you so much. Let's, like, there's a few points I'd like to return to a bit later, uh, especially like the idea of disempowerment 
See, um, maybe also the question of um, what you in Germany you call that narcissistische Kränkung, narcissistic insult, the insult to the narcissism of man, which is also happening just now. The stability do you expect also from, especially from a privileged side, the stability you expect to, to, to just exist. You book your travels and you are allowed to travel two months later and now suddenly it doesn't work like this anymore. Let's return to that in just a second. I think from the things we've been talking about before, Violetta um, may even engage with a few of those things. So um, Violetta, please, I'm really, really looking forward to, to your presentation. Hola, hola a todos. Hi. Eh, pues bueno, eh, rápidamente voy a platicar un poco sobre lo que ha sido mi experiencia. So I'll talk briefly about my experience in the curation art in the professional way. And, you know, I will start with a big school I had. That's when I was working in the Humex Foundation Gallery from 27 to 2012 in the curation program area. Humex now is one of the main private museums in Mexico. After that, I worked at the public sector in the La Tallera, which is like the female workshop. This is a museum, museum in Cuernavaca. This is a museum project that is called Siqueiros Project. And it has two museums, one in Mexico City in the Polanco neighborhood in, in Siqueiros' house and La Tallera, which is in Cuernavaca. From there, I think one of the most important projects that I made and you know that were very important for, for my work was the simultaneous project where I see a lot of echoes with, what, with what's happening right now. This is a project that I started uh, working with Paula Lopez Zambrano, a curator that is now living in London. And Simultaneo was about making this. Let's come up with virtual exhibitions in these two different places, sorry, three different places, La Tallera, some other space in Mexico, and some other space abroad. So for seven months, we did once a month this virtual exhibition. And this was a project that kind of made us struggle with different hours, different uh, problem settings, and especially, you know, the technologic issues. This was one of the, of the pieces shown back then. And today, I think this is becoming a, an everyday thing, you know, this kind of format. And then I uh, left La Tallera this INBA Museum Network. So I developed this project. I mean, I didn't left it to develop, but when I left it, I started developing this project. Maybe a bit, I was thinking about all these doubts, all these obstacles uh, I witnessed during my time in the private institution in Homex and then in the public institution as, uh, in, the, in La Tallera. The Satellite Project is, let's invite artists so they come up with ephemeral actions. I was thinking about sculpturality. I wasn't thinking about sculpturality of pieces, but on, on the contrary, something that you wouldn't grasp that has to happen and that you have to witness to, to actually experience the piece. This is an image of the piece by Maria Serva in the Museo Homex. A bit of the introduction you gave in, uh, I think it was like the other way around. I wanted to, to go to museum institutions, these pieces, but without institutional permit. I was interested especially to work like off boundaries to, to make them tense. What can you do in a museum? To think of it as a sp 
uh, as a public space, uh, quote unquote public, and what you can't do. So, you know, all artists have the freedom to choose which museum they want to put their show in. You know, it's a sort of a wink uh, and, and, and to to cause tension to these bureaucratic institutions that, you know, most artists, they they face these problems after an invitation and not the other way around. They, they don't propose a piece. It happens the other way around. And for instance, this was part of a piece from Lucia Hinojosa outside of the Tamayo Museum. Then we see this other one of Circe Irasema in the in the National Anthropology Museum where she she won it. I want just to tell a bit about this piece. This echoes to what Ali and Clara said about male art. This was an exhibition during the Ulysses Carrion exhibition in, at the Humex Museum. What Maria wanted was to make an exhibition that would make a piece that would make evidence that different times an exhibition can live through. So in this signs that you see on the floor, you see the voices and the thoughts of the visitors that had gone before to the exhibition. And so these new visitors will see those signs. Now this Luciana Hossa piece talked about the spectacularity of the exhibitions where you know you had a, a group of people clapping at people who was coming out of the museum as it was a show. Now this piece of Circe Irasema was at the National Anthropology Museum. What she wanted was to transform the iconic pieces, you know, the big hits of this museum and, you know, underline their multiple character, you know, outside of the museum space. You, you have a lot of things that you can find, the knockoff pieces that you see inside, you know, like a souvenir. So she wanted to, to stress this weird characteristic, this souvenir, these pieces to go by, you know, helium balloons that were installed outside the museum. This other piece was by Eduardo Baroa at the Munal. The artist decides to go into the museum hall and, and act the piece right before the other uh, paintings that are inside. So he chose the Jose Maria Velasco hall and the piece is remake, you know, the texts of the info note of the 10 paintings of Velasco with political notes, with political critic. So it's a lot of contrast with the vision, you know, this innocent, this candid vision of a modern burning vision that Velasco had about Mexico. And, you know, the vision much darker that it has now, a very complex, very dark, Vision Mexico has nowadays. This other piece was by Julieta Gil at the Bellas Artes Museum. This is a piece that is given in two ways, virtually and other in the physical space. So Julieta made a video that you can see in YouTube. This is a 360 tour where you can see uh, fragments in, uh, of a, a previous work from Julieta. So you can see them here in a virtual way. These are pieces of the Bellas Artes Museum in a landscape that may seem post-apocalyptic or you don't know if it's the bottom of the sea or because you see bubbles, you see algae. And you have notes around now, like, like graffiti laying around. You know, they talk about monuments, about monumentality, about inertia, about the futility of monuments when facing a, a living political context in a country. This 
was la, a satellite's last action. Uh, no longer happened at a museum, but this is in a public life, uh, one of the most important political life. This is a piece by Lorena Wolfer. This is sort of based in a different series that Lorena has, and she's been working that is called My Own Stories. So what we did here was we made a projection in the facade of the House of Congress in real time, you know, paragraphs, thoughts, experiences that people who were not nor uh, normalized, they wanted to share. So this piece was devoted to women, to non-binary people, to uh, the elder children, you know, people that is not considered into the public policies that are being decided within these premises. This lasted around, no, I mean, no longer than two hours. So this was one of the last actions we made at Satellite. Satellite has also worked for me as a space for research. We have a YouTube channel. Where I put up, you know, uh, a curator archive talking about curation, the curation interest, representative project of their own career. And so right now we have over 40 interviews in the channel and some others that we are editing and we are about to upload there. We can see another piece here at Satellite. This is called Mexico Conceptual from Heriberto Yepes. This happened in 2016. This was the website where, you know, Heriberto for 30 days was adding a different text every day. The ephemeris characteristic here was that, you know, text would disappear every day. So if you would go today, you, you would see a text for, for 24 hours. Next day, it was gone. So a new one came up. So I was also interested in, in this project to explore the function of archive from the digital standpoint. How can you do archive from the internet? And also thinking that, you know, the web has an ephemeral characteristic per se. Right now, we have a, a Ryzen project that is called Net, Net Art Anthology that closed in 2016. So they included Mexico Conceptual, this Jeppes piece in their anthology. And the Net Art Anthology is part of Bison and the new museum. And they also uh, published this book. And the same people, Rise on a new mission, Rise on, which started as a, an online platform to recover and to archive all pieces that were happening in on the internet. You know, they also speak about my own interest of exploring the digital archive. So they created in 2018, a website that is called, it's a, it's, it's a sort of recording, it's called like Codifer. It's like an online pages uh, recorder. It's a way to preserve your, your, your website that maybe they appear briefly and then they are erased. So that's it. As far as my professional and personal experience, I think that this year has been, you know, a, a milestone for my interests and for my, how I address art. I will quickly tell you some projects I made this year and that are leading to, to what I'm thinking of doing in 2021. This is Casa del Lago, where Samara Guzman made a website that was a sort of transnational company. 
and they, she makes like a note like um, you know about cor transnational corporations how they address their employees and this has to do a lot with how we work now I mean maybe not us in art but people who are working in corporations. This piece by Miguel Monroy makes a Google Maps tour looking for the reflection of the car that takes the pictures. So there are different times where the Google car is pictured itself without intending to. This other piece that the Tanicolai they made, the, they are two based from Paris, and this is based in the chess game that decided the life. Uh, it's a sort of uh, insider piece in, in the art world. This is where Marcel Duchamp played chess with Picabia, and he lost. And he stopped editing one of the most important magazines in art, which is The Blind Man. This chess game and the notes of, of, of the chess game then came in a, in, a, in a further magazine that edited by Duchamp. And based on this annotation, Deta Nicolai made this video. They changed pieces by words. My Plant Sounds was another of, of the pieces in Casa del Lago, where you would send a picture of your plant, you know, was they were one of the first companions we had in, in, the, in the lockdown. For many people, they meant uh, to be with something, a uh, sort of lifesaver, so they can reduce stress levels. And the page was, you send your plant picture as sort of a, a portrait, and the Radio Nopal team would play a song for the plant. So a whole playlist was built and on the website for their plants. Now this was by Minerva Cuevas where all these pieces, you can see them online from the Casa del Lago website. Here Minerva Cuevas made some videos of birds that visited her studio. And she completed this with quotes or texts of books she was reading that, that for her sounded that there was a, an accompaniment during this waiting time. And I think it's very funny how Tlaxcala 3 are also talking about objects, you know. This piece here of Monica Espinosa was a, a series of gifts about objects being broken down. So for Monica Espinosa, it's a sort of an object laughing. They laugh at us, you know, uh, a dish breaks, a plant moves, uh, a sheet wrinkles. These are sort of cackles from objects. Uh, and then I did a selection of pieces for a text that appeared on the El País by Almudena Barragan. She wanted to talk about lockdown. So I made this selection of works that now is building up to what I want to show you in the end. Women in these waiting times, in these houses. So for me, walls, when we talk about mulas, the, the most important walls now are our own houses. So beyond the border walls, I was interested in talking about the walls that are holding us down every day and are containing us every day. And you know, here I just show some images and, and projects that really caught my attention this last month. You know, this edition that they made about all lockdown uh, business, how people were being evicted, how many people be, um, transformed their houses in war environments, and you know how technology or have made all of us, many people who work in house deliveries to do this kind of things that beyond doing a, a, an artistic aesthetic way of 
of getting work. You know, these phones hung in trees outside Walmarts or supermarkets, you know, big chains. They put it there so they they can have more orders, so they can have more deliveries, you know, more work. A sort of uh, of of rising above the other phones. Uh, this is a very important note of where commerce, where everyday life is heading to. Um, Violeta, could we like come to an end slowly so we can continue talking? That'd be that'd be amazing. Yeah, so now, and now these are one of the last images and they, uh, they I just want to wrap up what I showed in 2020. I think my interests are around projects that talk about land, about houses, you know, projects like this, the Center for Land Use Interpretation, the work of Monica Riola, and also Amauta Garcia. This is a, a piece that is placed in a, an area of the city. There is a very large contrast where you can see the Santa Fe neighborhood and the Palo Alto community. And I think that this is my interest now. I want to I want to propose a new radical diversity from there. You know, especially thinking about the house, about how can we get a living space. So now I think that museums have failed in that sense because you know people who work from within the museum institutions, at least in the public world. Well, they don't, they are not being paid at, at, uh, in time. So, you know, this is a big battle and I, so this is a big representation of the current time within the institutions. Uh, that's it. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Violeta, for that um, amazing and very diverse like presentation with a lot of stuff to kind of pick on to and talk about. Um, let me let me try to to also ask you one question because before we 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 talk together, um, because when we talked for the preparation for this show, something we talked about and and something you insisted on was that. Um, the thing you just said now, museums said failed, was something that you kind of came to your consciousness just this year, especially. And I, I wanted to ask about um, uh, how this year shaped the way you think about your own work, um, especially with the pandemic situation, um, uh, how that kind of changed your idea of curation and of art and the way those things um, connect with the world. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think that mostly to not drift around, you know, in the sense that, you know, my struggle, my interest should be focused that our, in, in that our work may is a, a way of living, of earning a living, a, a proper way of living. You know, I feel... I mean, I can't, I cannot talk about any other thing now as a curator about this. How, from the museum context, how can I achieve the basic things to make a living? I mean, I couldn't be talking about a topic that is not mine to see every day. And my everyday working in museums is this. We cannot, and museums cannot provide a dignified way of living to their employees. For me, that's 
I, I want to focus on there. How can we achieve that from the museum, from your house? Maybe no longer the museum. That's my other thing. Maybe it's not there at the museum anymore. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's in, in street projects. Maybe it's in other kind of work that has nothing to do with the theory, with the academy, but, but rather by doing without thinking. Doing community, not thinking about community. And so maybe those projects, they don't fit in a museum, you know? Because, you know, beyond uh, being theoretic, well, the important thing is to survive. You know, get this self-sustainable life where your work will give you the elemental things to have a proper life. Thank you. That, that it's, it's hard. It's tough. Yeah. I, I find it extremely interesting because, I mean, on a different scale, that is something that, that um, is getting more existential in Germany as well the longer the crisis continues. Um, so I'd like to invite Clara and Ali to also just, just what, what are your thoughts on that? How's the situation in your, let's say, um, uh, surrounding and how what is the especially uh, how, what are the effects on the thoughts you have about art uh, gracias violeta max thank you violeta and max by you know <laughs> causing this uh, question about the situation. I'm sorry. You want me to stop uh, sharing my screen? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, thank you for causing this question, this reflection. How can we have the, the effects, the current context in the art? So Clara and I, we agree that this is why we came up with Tascala 3, this self-sustained instance. When we changed government from 2018 to 2019, and you know, the fourth transformation that the current president was announcing, we knew Clara and I, we predicted that, you know, this could be a wonderful moment for art and culture or a radical pauperization, which is what's happening. So we think that from self-sustaining, we can have the, the necessary to live. We, I mean, we cannot talk because we, we're trying to break free from capitalism. So I, I also think that a radical idea we did at the Scala 3, a Clara's proposal, by moving around objects is putting a table outside the house and ask our friends that if you don't use an object, place them outside the house. So put it in your mailbox. So someone put some coins, a sort of, you know, a bargain, a mobile bargain, so we could come up with resources for our everyday activities, not to, to uh, survive. So we, we could have input, so we could receive people in Tlaxcala. So this thing that Violeta mentioned about the neighborhood life, the community life, I think it's also a very important thing in at neighborhood level, in a context that has to do with... The, the nearby community that is not necessarily involved in a project understand that it's there's something outside there's a different effect to have economic resources without waiting for a budget top but rather to receive what we get this is what we can work with if we are creative persons i think we can also solve in art for, on one hand we can analyze our own context in a different perspective. If art has this possibility of opening up the spectrum of ideas, this is where we can use this place in art to reflect how can we engage with, I don't know if community, but with different collectivities. That, that would be my, my thought. Hmm. Uh, Clara, do you, yeah, exactly. 
Great. Sí, gracias. No, gracias, Violeta eh, y Max, por la pregunta. Ali, por, Thank you, por... Violeta, Max, de... and Ali, for this idea. I, I would like to say this. I don't know if everyone who listens to us know, but Mexico City is the fifth most populated city in the world. The, you have there around 21 million people every day, you know, moving around. So I think this is a very important thing to understand art in Mexico and in Mexico City because, you know, this big city is the result of centralist policies. This is a very centralist oriented country. So, you know, this centralism causes power hierarchies in the poli in politics, like Violeta said, but as well, uh, this happens also in art structures. So, you know, you have a lot of notions, uh, very vice stuff things, you know, competency, individual. You know, if you're an artist, you, you get a lot of anxiety. The guy next door will win the exhibition, the other curator got the budget and you didn't. So it kind of becomes a very toxic environment. So for us, we love art. We think that art does have this possibility of imagining other features and understanding other presence and also understanding the past. Like we believe it's a privileged space to understand different ways of living. So, you know, we kind of opted to go small in a 20 million person city. Where do you begin? And the irony here is that even though we know each other, you know, this pandemic has shown that we don't really know each other so well and we are not really organized for anything, you know. You know, if a, if a, a friend gets sick or, you know, you the basic needs, but sometimes you don't even, you're not even aware or, or we never talked in person before. So I think that this pandemic has been a catalyst that to, for people to organize, to self-organize from art. And I yeah, also not that, that not lose sight of these huge projects that we want to do from poli policies, from neoliberal uh, new spaces and, and public spaces. And like Violeta said, to think that we need to think that museums are public spaces. So how can they answer to these needs, but also inwards, how they can take care of, provide uh, proper wages to their staff and give maintenance to the object collections, you know, objects that are not being taken care of right now. You always have this new, new project that by magic, a new museum will uh, pop up and, and we think, why another museum? I mean, we don't need more museums. We, we need to take care of the ones that are already there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, there's a question coming in, which, which is just kind of connecting to the, to the things that we have been talking about so far, which is raising or throwing in the term um, um, resistance. So it's asking, uh, do you think that the fact that you moved away from artistic institutions or you founded your own institution um, in order to find self-managed spaces is a form of resistance? And if so, how has this changed the way you conceive art? Uh, I me gustaría responder esa, esa pregunta. Uh, uh, I would like to, to answer that question. I think the answer is yes and no. You know, yes, in the sense that, yeah, I mean, it's resistance to these topics, you know, wanting to talk about what moves you or what signifies something for you. Public museums and also private museums, they follow a curation line that is defined by the state. I mean, you don't you don't get to to arrive to the museum and, and say, "Hey, this is my curation." I know every museum is devoted to a specific research line. So I think that 
creating self-sustained projects, it is a way of resisting these lines that are not necessarily line. It's not good thing and bad thing. They are just personal themes and maybe they don't address a state's cultural policy, which is also a good thing to have different voices, sometimes younger voices in these self-sustained projects. And we cannot deny that we need the support from those institutions, you know, these grants. There is no way to, to completely stepping outside of it if you still want to work in the art world. And the, the truly radical is that if, if we stopped calling this art or curation, but you know, we're, we are one to talk to ourselves now. So I think there is a, there is a way of resistance, but also it has boundaries, you know? Yeah, I could say that I think there are several ways of resistance. Also, you know, working from within an institution is a way of resisting. I, I think a lot of people is working now in, in the museums, UNAM, university, culture ministers, and they resist from the inside. You know, kind of looking for different policies to apply to museums. And, you know, for us, we, I mean, we don't want to shut down the door. We, we don't believe we are so autonomous. We think we are assisting what we need from each other against this idea of competence and individuality. We think that if a field is to be healthy, we need to consider that everyone is affected by everyone else's actions. So, you know, coming up with exhibitions, projects at public institutions, is also making public policies and leave a legacy for the people that's coming behind us. So, you know, I think resistance has to happen within and without, you know. It has to happen from both sides. We cannot let go. We pay for public museums with our taxes, right? I mean, it's not that like someone is giving us. Yeah, we are supposed to be working so we can access what's going on at museums. So, so yeah, I think it's we have a long way to, to go. But you know, about resistance, I do think that it has to do within and without. And every day in, in a way, but yeah, it's resisting. When you self-sustain yourself, you need to resist, to resist. Maybe you don't know if you're gonna make it to the end of the next week. Well, you know, you gotta keep going. Otherwise, if we don't build the forms we want, you know, future is now, it's, it's here. Yeah, so in that way, when we talk from within, like Clara said, I think another way of resistance in the outside, you know, with policies, whatever there is outside, it's already corrupted. It's already tainted, you know, by policies that we don't even get to see. Those walls are so tall that we cannot see behind which policy is happening. What, But from within, from the domestic wall, here we cannot get corrupted if we don't want to, because it's not a public space. This is not a private space, but you decide to regulate or to say that it's not easy to corrupt what happens within a domestic wall. So what we do within this domestic wall in Tlaxcala 3 is to organize ourselves, think about ourselves as a different way of existing in this new other order that is fracturing every day. As, as Clara says, the future is now. Maybe the future is no longer the concept. It was 40, 50 years. The here and the now is where we need to resist. And to be placed now and here is already a resistance in itself. Uh, thank you. Um, 
I've been I've been thinking about in in a German context. I've been thinking about how certain ideas of art, which is especially art as a point of orientation for society in the present, sometimes even as an idea of people of something people would have to adopt to how certain notions of national art are like are blocking ideas of resistance, are blocking in insight into the fact that art has has been all along a strategy to resist as well. So if you're looking at art that hasn't been done by the great German figures like Schiller or Goethe, or you know, like people who are being canonized as the most important art, but you start looking beyond, suddenly what you see is that there's a lot of artists, a lot of people who used art as a means to resist, as a means to stay different. Um, as what we call, that, what, what we have started to call Wehrhafte Poesie, m- drawn from the concept of militant democracy, militant, militant art, militant poetry, mil- poetry or art that can be used to resist a certain claim by the presence to become homogenous, to become the same, to be, to be kind of put into a frame of integration, which is a very German term, very German demand for everyone to behave in a certain way. Um, and how this con- contradicts an idea of pluralistic democracy. So make, I don't know, like we're trying to build those bridges from a German context to the, to the Mexican, but, but is there anything that, that, that you find resonating with your situation uh, when I say that. Yeah, Violetta. Sí, o sea, sobre todo, o sea, ahora con esta construcción. Yeah, I mean, especially right now with the, with the project Chapultepec, which is a huge new museum, it's going to be really blatantly clear and sad as well, to realize that many junk projects that had to do with art and were proposed as this, let's not think the same everyone, let's come up with the, let's come up with a heterogeneous construction and, and also these critical projects, they will be co-opted by this situation of the state of the Chapultepec project. I mean, I think this is a sign that, you know, the truly radical is to do politics and be aware of politics to know about the current times. I mean, there is no way of being radical from artistic proposals that are only reflecting about the aesthetics. Yeah, I agree. Like we from Tascala 3, we talk a lot about this, you know, how affinities with people who approach Tascala 3 are, they are aesthetical affinities, but, but they are mostly social and political. What Max was saying, you know, unlike these hegemonic notions of art, you know, legitimize, you know, the big art inside. Yeah, they are in a you know, museum. You know, they are changing how we can relate. You know, the art is not only aesthetics for us. You know, artistic planets are, are are also proposing a way of relating to each other. So you know, like for us in the project, we uh, presented in the domestic world. We, we had to see how you have different positions to observe well. And what Violeta said, there are different ways of entering a museum or proposing how art is linked to to a museum to be like right there on the edge we like a, there no being on the border edge i really think that whether to go inward if these border things are becoming mainstream now or now or rather looking different ways that they can live together now i'm, I'm thinking about this integration and the pluralistic democracy yeah, I think this is really tricky, you know, I mean, because, yeah, walls and policies, they are aiming for a homogeneous thing, a monocultive and not a native forest. So what would imply to think of a native forest where you get big trees, but you have small uh, bushes and uh, animals and they all live together. So if the forest is a pluralistic democracy, well, then maybe, yeah. But knowing that the forest will generate 
Really different levels of life and trees will communicate among each other below the earth. You know, I'm thinking, how could we make society to become that? A forest in which not everyone is a same tree, but we're a native pluralistic forest. I think this is a challenge. For me, this is amazing, you know, just talk about this is, I think, yeah, there's a way to go in the first world countries and the third world countries. Maybe we are not using those terms that much, but, you know, when I was in college, I was taught that and we live in the third world. And that's true. You don't see the difference that we live here every day here. So, you know, I think that's also very interesting. We don't have a dividing wall and there's a sea dividing us. And yeah, there's also a position of, of observing from there and from here. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Ali. Yeah, I was just thinking about this thing Max said about the integration uh, framework, you know. This politicized art. Anyway, I mean, I I rather think that in this situation where art notions are hegemonic or the European dominant dis discourse is, you know, the masterpiece, the master, the most important, we kind of need to understand that art is just an aesthetic object that obviously has its depth, profundity, its era, its artistic movement, you get a reflection, but I do insist, art is this space, even a hegemonic dominant discourse or, or the speech was that this is art, this is, that by the way, many notions of what we get of what art is, they come from Germany and thanks to Germany, we need, we have to see the big piece, the big massive. Now I'm thinking about Latin America in our third world context, you know, being in the third world is resisting. Obviously, it's not the same that in a European context that probably right now people may stay at home because the state privileges uh, given to them. Many of us, we don't get that. Less of all in the art field, you know, the poverty stricken field of art is really hard to, a hard pill to swallow. But we can see the processual art or the art processes by including them into the everyday thing. We haven't given ourselves the space to reflect on that. And art does give us the possibility to think how we can exist today, how we feel today. And this is kind of a, 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 a reflection gluing stuff you all three said. I hope I was clear with this. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Now your, your video is gone and your sound is still there, but thank you. Um, let's, uh, I think we're going to have a last question and then we'll have to wrap it up already. Although it feels for me like we've just, Jay, we just got started, um, but we're approaching 90 minutes and then, then, um, we have to, we have to, we have to end that talk. Um, let me ask one last, yeah, you let in a second. Let me ask one last question <laughs> coming from a, from, from the audience, and then Yoletta is going to be the first to, to say something. Oh, right? Is that okay? So we're going to do the last round, and then, then you can you can say maybe also things that are still missing. And now this question, I think it puts puts the finger to something that we have really, we have tried to build the framework for a certain concept, for differences, for things that have changed in our thinking this year also. And this is asking for what is still missing uh, in the art we do, you do, for an accessibility, a socialized accessibility of all those reflections. So what is still missing? It could be a lack of funds, it could be a lack of language, it could be like whatever you feel like. Let's talk about stuff that still needs to be done. Um, please, last round, thank you. I'm really, really- Ronda. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to propose as, yeah, just like you said, this is the beginning. So we kind of need to make this a workshop, you know, a seminary or something. It's really interesting, this, Ali. 
And now let me think about that question. Anyone care to? We think that the first thing that is missing is talking about it. Just discussing these topics, not in a hierarchical place where you have a teacher and they say, this is art, you need to do this. Rather, you need to look to remove the hierarchical part of the word of art. We think that we need to do this, we have to decide together, we have to keep talking, we have to keep organizing ourselves. We have also supported a group of several artists and cultural managers on their name of Crit Malesa Critica, Critical Bush. We have been reflecting about this Chapultepec project where they are intending to use the 25% of the total country's culture budget in a one project, which is in the center of Mexico City, in the most expensive area of the city. So we see these contradictions here, you know, and we think that, you know, art needs to stop being imposed up to down and needs to be happening from down to towards up, you know. I think we, just, we still have a long way to go, but we're getting there step by step, opening communication channels and power as well, you know. We need to talk with power groups, but also together, it's, it, I think it's easier. So we need to look for those allies. That's essential. And this is a conversation that has been about finding allies in different latitudes. That has been really nice about it too. Solo para completar un poco lo que dice Clara. Oh, yeah, maybe just to elaborate on Clara's comment. I think what we miss is to recognize the working rights, the labor rights of art employees. When you place, you know, creators and all the people who work, curators, staff, designers, you know, all people, that make an exhibition happen, we need to acknowledge them as people who need to be protected under the basic labor conditions. So, so you know, they can work a bit better. I think there's a, a, an extreme wear and tear inside and outside institutions. Because of this, because you are struggling to survive, to get a wage in due time and form. And this is really exhausting, you know? People get excited. I mean, people need to live off their jobs. That's the main thing. Let's consider art and art workers as, as any other worker, not, you know, a creator uh, from this romantic position. I think that would need to happen. So to wrap this thing, I want to say that we need to cause that we need to admit ourselves as vulnerable. We need to self-organize so we can keep conversing, you know, circles, you know, we need to know what the other person is and acknowledge their vulnerability. I, I would like to say that as my closing remark. Well, thank you all so much. Um, just to kind of repeat the things you just mentioned now, because I think I'd like to like, highlight them also for a German context, because this is still some, there's no union of writers, there's no real union of, of art workers. It doesn't really exist. We're like, we're just starting to try and to build that up, especially with the pandemic now, it feels like there's a lot of like, like, you know, they have this talk of like necessary work that has to be done and art for sure is not part of the necessary work. So um, they're being defunded, they're being closed up. That is something we still have to kind of, we have to think about that. We have to think about is like, is our, our the work Totalmente. necessary? And if yes, how? 
So that is something that is going on. I think it connects all of us because the pandemic is, even though first and, and diff, first world and so-called other worldly countries uh, uh, are still in this world. So they, they still, like we still face certain questions. And I think what we do now is just trying to build up this communication, this discussion. And by seeing that those things are going on also in Mexico and also in the US and also in Germany, this already gives me a sense of, this not being only a specific problem, but a universal problem that we have to talk about. So, and we have to do something about that. It's not only talking, it's also doing. So we had the idea of conversation. We had the idea of, of allyship, which is something that, that I'm like, like trying to like thinking through as well. The idea of work, workers' rights, which is great. Um, and something we missed and, and Ali raised that in something I would have liked to know more about, but this is great and a good discussion you have to end with a question is what does this empowerment mean and how, how could we achieve that um but that'd be that'd be something left for another discussion thank you all for coming thanks for the audience to stay to drink your coffee with us um in our next discussion which is also hosted by goethe institute in montreal that time in canada this is going to be taking this is going to be taking place on november 18th and Mohammed Amjahid, who's my colleague from Germany, he's going to speak with the art historian Charmaine Nelson and another person which is yet to be announced um, about white knowledge production and a new era for anthropology and social sciences. So as you see, we are covering different grounds. This time it was art. Um, if you want to check out the other discussions, go to the Goethe website, type in radical diversity. You're going to find the other ones on YouTube. Uh, uh, and you're also going to find our discussion very soon online. Really hoping you're going to be part of our discussion next time. And thank you for being part of the discussion this time. Thank you. I really hope to see you in person one day. Thank you. Esperamos que los muros nos dejen atravesar las fronteras. Let's hope that walls would, would allow us to cross borders. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Ali, Violeta. Thank you to Elena and Bettina.